difficulty. Um, my name is Willa Morris. I'm a Columbia YDSA organizer. Um, and we are here today to have a discussion as part of the Columbia Tuition Strike Teach-In Series, which has had 13 different panels so far. And this is our uh, follow-up panel on Saturday. The Columbia Tuition Strike started yesterday. It is the largest tuition strike in American history. Um, and so far, there are thousands of students at Columbia withholding tuition as a method of direct action in which these students are protesting against uh, rising fees at universities as well as uh, undemocratic decisions made at the university regarding investments in fossil fuels, uh, companies that enable apartheid in Palestine and expansion projects into Harlem. Um, so far, we've actually had great success with this direct action and yesterday, we were able to win a uh, divestment from fossil fuels from Columbia University, as well as Columbia has increased financial aid, um, as well as other financial concessions on our first day of the strike. Um, this is part of a much larger movement, which is trying to use direct action as a tactic to win leftist political goals. And today we're going to talk about this tactic of direct action and talk about this larger system of capitalism in which the Columbia University exists. And this is going to be a little bit of a different panel from our others yesterday. And this is going to be a historical discussion of the Cold War shift to neoliberalism that uh, existed throughout the world um, during the late 20th century. We have a very exciting uh, lineup of panelists today. And if I could ask each of the panelists to please turn their cameras on. Um, and I will briefly introduce everyone before we get started. Again, this has been very stressful, but I think that we're good to go now. Thank you everyone for being here today. I'm very, very excited about these panelists. These are some of my favorite people. Um, and today, the topic of discussion is going to be what happened to the left after World War II and how we can think about this problem today. And so the way we can think about this is that after World War II in both the global North and the global South, there was enthusiasm for what the world could become in places like the United States, Italy, France, there were large strikes and there was a rising of communist parties in France and Italy. In the global south, there were anti-colonial movements in which people were finally trying to get independence from their colonizers. And there was this large feeling of hope for something that could be different following World War II. But by the 1970s and 1980s, a lot of this hope had disappeared. The language of socialism had been replaced with a language of human rights. And today, in most of these places, the idea of socialism, um, at least up until recently, seemed like something of the past. And so we have a great list of panelists today to talk about um, this shift from lots of different angles. Um, we have Gabriel Winnant, Quinn Slobodian, Barnaby Rain, Christy Thornton, and Annie Oluka Tariba. So thank you everyone for being here today. We're going to start off with one question for each of the panelists before opening up to a general discussion. If any of the attendees today have any questions, they could drop them in the chat and I can use these questions for our follow-up discussion afterwards. So thank you again for everyone being here today. And we're going to start with Gabe and ask a question um, about deindustrialization that took place in the United States. And so, Gabe, you write that deindustrialization in cities like Pittsburgh was a slow process beginning in the 1950s rather than an abrupt shift around 1970. Why is it important to recognize this distinction? And can you explain how this process of deindustrialization occurred? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Congratulations to you all on your victories so far and your solidarity so far. It's a really uh, amazing achievement. A friend of mine who went to Columbia Actually, I think I'll say who he is, uh, Nikhil Saval, who is now a state senator from Philadelphia. So I was doing this panel and texted me and said, can you tell me anything about this Columbia struggle? It seems amazing. So I just wanted to kind of pass that on um, because it's a very impressive thing. And you all, I hope, I hope you all feel really proud. Um, so uh, deindustrialization, I think is important to, under to answer your question. It's important to understand is a long secular process 
uh, for a number of reasons. So you brought up Pittsburgh because I, my, my book, which is coming out uh, in two months, is about Pittsburgh, but uh, we can say this of most American industrial cities, including New York, which is a great industrial city once, and I think this is often forgotten. Um, it's important to understand this because the reorganization of the American working class, its fragmentation, decomposition, and potential recomposition uh, played out unevenly across the course of the last 75 or so years. Um, the organized industrial working class, the one that engaged in the great strike wave of 1946 that you were just referring to, Willem, uh, that we, if we see that moment as a kind of high water point, you know, when 5% of all Americans, not just workers, but Americans went on strike in 1946, uh, they then were immediately met with a series of defeats led by McCarthyism and the Red Scare, uh, and then the process of increasing automation and uh, disinvestment and plant, plant mobility beginning in the 50s, such that by the time the 1970s came about and global trade competition and input cost pressures had risen really dramatically, uh, leading to the kind of classic moment of deindustrialization, the working class was already severely divided. That division developed all through the 1940s, 50s, and uh, 60s, up until the moment uh, when deindustrialization became very visible with large scale plant closures. And it meant that, well, first of all, that division played out along lines of race, most significantly. Black workers were generally uh, the last hired and the first fired in industrial work when they had access to it at all. But it also meant that um, access to social benefits which were privatized in the post-war United States were distributed unevenly across the American working class because the best way to get healthcare and retirement and vacation and all, all of the things that we associate with uh, the 20th century welfare state, if you were a working class American in the 20th century was through a factory job. Uh, and so social citizenship itself was fragmented. And when the onslaught of neoliberalism then came, there was not anything that you could recognize as a uh, unif unified and organized working class able to meet it because it was so badly divided already by the long experience of deindustrialization. So I'll leave that there for the moment. For sure. And Gabe, if I could ask just a quick follow-up question. Um, in your book, you talk about the similarities between the rise in mass incarceration in places like California and the expansion of the healthcare industry in places like Pittsburgh. Can you talk a little bit about this connection and also explain the political consequences of the shift from industrial labor to service work? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I always feel like I need to qualify that comparison to say, uh, just because things are kind of structurally homologous doesn't mean that they are uh, on similar political and moral standing, right? I think we should have a healthcare system, unlike a prison system. Um, but, uh, the dynamic that I just described, the kind of gradual and accelerating process of deindustrialization from the 50s until about 1980, displaced populations unevenly and led to the development unevenly of surplus populations that were in one way or another required uh, political response. I think we have come to understand pretty well how the development of the carceral state was uh, a preferred form of political response in many cases, right? And um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's book on California that I think you're alluding to there tells this story um, of the warehousing of surplus population. Another dynamic by which uh, deindustrialization and the emergence of neoliberalism just produced new surplus populations was in how it left behind populations that were older and sicker and poorer in various and overlapping configurations. Uh, and this was true, again, across the Rust Belt, including New York City. Um, those populations, however, often by dint of some combination of being older and sicker and um, often having some kind of retiree benefits that were legacies of the previous moment of industrial employment, uh, were often more able to make claims on the healthcare system than they were on virtually any other kind of social support. Now, that's not to say like health insurance was great and the care that they got was excellent, but Healthcare actually was more of a nexus of social support flowing into increasingly dispossessed communities 
than virtually any other comparable thing. And so that meant that amid economic ruin, the healthcare industry grew and fed off that ruin and uh, hired people. And the people that it hired were generally the daughters and granddaughters of formerly industrial workers, um, leading to the growth, which was still ongoing today, of a heavily feminized low wage service sector working class, particularly uh, composed of women of color in formerly industrial cities. Great, and so this shift and this shift to, to deindustrialization and the uh, fall of the left didn't just take place in places in the global north like the United States, the United Kingdom, but there was also this larger shift that took place um, in the global south. And one way to capture this rise in the fall of the left and movements for economic independence is by looking at the plight of the NIEO. Um, next, we will go to Christy Thornton. Christy is an assistant professor at John Hopkins and is the author of a recent book called Revolution in Development, Mexico and the Governance of the Global Economy. Christy, could you tell us what was the NIEO and why was the goal of economic independence for its member countries ultimately unsuccessful? Yeah, thanks for having me. And again, like Gabe, I'll congratulate um, all of you uh, for the work that you've accomplished in this short period. Um, I'm an alum of both Barnard and SIPA. And so um, I uh, feel very close to the struggle that you're having as an original member of the Columbia Student Solidarity Network in the late 90s, hearkening back to people like Mike Golash, who I see here in the chat, who's a 68er. Um, it's, it's a really impressive legacy you all are, are drawing on here. Um, so the NIEO is this moment that um, for a long time was really forgotten um, and has recently come to be sort of remembered as a moment of global South struggle for a fairer world order. Um, it emerges in the 1970s, really building off of activism that had happened during the 1960s um, within the UN at the UN General Assembly is really the locus of the NIEO. Um, and it builds on other kinds of movements, um, you know, pan-African movements, pan-Arabist movements, the non-aligned movement, um, and really puts forward a framework to regulate global trade and investment in ways that would be, um, uh, in ways that would, the attempt was to try and make global capitalism work for both North and South. There are massive tensions within the NAI movement precisely because there are sort of more radical um, socialist and communist party affiliated actors um, who are arguing for a kind of more um, thoroughgoing revolutionary overthrow of the existing global economic system. And then there are actors who are more interested in a kind of reformist position, a position that um, you know, sees just putting the right kind of rules and regulations and institutions in place. Um, and so, Thinking about the NEIO, which culminates in 1974 with the passage of a resolution calling for a new international economic order, and then subsequently um, the passage at the General Assembly of this thing called the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, which I've written about extensively, um, those two UN resolutions are really sort of global calls for um, new kinds of regulations to be enforced. And the idea is to, um, control the power of the emerging multinational capital, um, the ability of foreign investors and, and multinational corporations to sort of pursue speculative profits and extractive kinds of industries throughout the third world. The idea was to give an international framework for third world countries um, to sort of reject that kind of um, speculation and predation from the capitalists of the global north. Um, of course, the power imbalance there is massive, right? So many people think of the NEIO as a kind of trade union of the poor countries. The idea, um, and particularly with the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, which is the um, initiative is very much led by um, the Mexican state actors that I study. Um, there's an idea that if the poor countries can kind of get together and, um, you know, sort of um, gather together akin to the way that workers would gather together in a labor union that they can fight back against the power of capital. Um, and so the Mexicans that I study sort of explicitly say this. They say, you know, we think of the global north as the capitalists, we think of the global south as the workers, and what we want to create are kind of good collective contracts. 
Um, and so there, as I said, there are tensions within this movement. Um, the ways that it gets defeated are really interesting, but ultimately come down to the ability of global capital, particularly, you know, um, in places like the United States to a lesser extent in Western Europe at this point, but especially US capital um, to really make its voice heard um, among the representatives, the state representatives of the global North, the United States, Western Europe, um, to argue strongly against this. So the NEIO passes the UN General Assembly without a vote. Um, it's just uh, sort of by acclamation, they say, yes, we wanna call for a new, new international economic order. And in some sense, that's because um, the countries of the global North took that moment a little less seriously than, or the capitalists in the global North took that moment a little less seriously than they took the ongoing negotiations and the subsequent passage of the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. And the question about that, that document, the CERDs, was whether it would have kind of a legally binding protection, whether it would change international law in some way to make it so that um, multinational corporations didn't have the kind of open purview on the world that they had had up to that point. Um, and so there's a really strong fight over the charter um, and it passes eventually in December of 1974 um, with 120 countries voting against it, but the United States and major countries in Western Europe voting, um, I mean, 120 countries voting for it, the United States, Western Europe voting against it. Um, and they had also ensured over the course of the process that it would not have any kind of legally binding power. So there's an interesting move. They both kind of take the teeth out of the charter in some ways, and then they still vote against it when it comes to the UN General Assembly. So um, in that way, and, and you know, Quinn has written extensively about these kinds of organizations, um, things like the National Foreign Trade Council, the National Association of Manufacturers, these really powerful associations of capitalists in the United States, really organize and put pressure on, for instance, people who are appointed to the UN, um, US UN delegation at the time to get the US to vote against this. So it's a complicated moment and the politics are complicated, um, but there is a kind of, um, the actors at the time are making a parallel between the kind of questions of uh, labor organizing and building kind of good collective contracts that go to the questions that Gabe was just speaking to as well. So there's a, that's kind of um, the idea of that sort of collective action um, and organizing on an international front from the global south is something that really animates that moment of the NIEO. Great. And so Chrissy, um, one of the countries during this period in the 1970s that was part of the push to the left, um, especially from before 1973 was Chile. And so you had um, obviously the coup in Chile in 1973 with Augusto Pinochet forcibly removed um, the socialist government from power, but also you have um, the Chilean economist, Orlando Letier, who actually worked on some of the policies for the NIEO. In 1976, he worked on a book on this new international economic order. And at the same time, in that year, the American government assassinated Orlando Letier on in Washington DC with a car bomb. And so these are examples of some violence that was used to kind of forcibly uh, push against this movement for um, economic independence for these countries in the global south. But there are also other ways in which um, this these movements were subverted, whether it be uh, loans or any of these things. And so can you talk you know, a little bit more about the different ways in which movements like the NIEO or just general economic independence movements in the global south were subverted during this period. Yeah, that's a really important point. So we have to remember, of course, that this is um, a really key moment in the global Cold War. And that plays out differently in different places. Obviously, um, you have the Vietnam War going on during all of this. Um, you know, we're, we're, by the time we get to 1974, we're kind of reaching the end. The United States is being defeated in Vietnam. You have decolonization happening elsewhere in Asia, also in Africa and the Middle East. You have the countries of Latin America that have been nominally independent for you know, 150 years by that point, but are still kind of struggling with the idea of economic sovereignty and economic independence. Um, so those questions are all really important motivating questions at this moment. And there's a real sense, particularly after um, the Cuban revolution of 1959, um, and then as you say, the election of Salvador Allende in 1970, um, from a Latin American perspective, and then obviously with all of the decolonization movements going on in Africa and the Middle East and Asia, 
a sense that the peoples of the global south might actually vote for, fight for, build revolutions for a different way of ordering their economies and societies. And so fighting back against that becomes really key geopolitically to a US state that is waging this cold war, right? Um, the, the things that are gonna happen in the aftermath of the NEI moment, NEIO moment, when the United States sort of realizes that the UN has become a forum for this kind of activism, and that this institution that the United States in some sense created as a kind of um, forum for projecting its own power after World War II has sort of turned against it. The United States makes a decision, particularly people within the foreign policy establishment make the decision that they are going to turn against the UN General Assembly. Um, and so that struggle at the time, the idea that a country like Chile might find an electoral path to socialism, right? That was very different than, for instance, what had happened in the Cuban revolution and the threat that was being brought in other parts of Latin America and other parts of the third world where there were insurgent movements, right? Actual armed guerrilla movements that were being repressed by their own state. And then obviously with help from the United States and the global North. So that um, the, the kind of ongoing struggle for the recognition particularly 1960s and 1970s, that political independence was going to be insufficient, right? That simply achieving, sort of throwing off the yoke of colonialism and achieving um, self-government was going to be insufficient for allowing a kind of true liberation. And countries in Africa and Asia looked to the experience of countries in Latin America and they said, look, they've been independent for 150 years and they still have to deal with the economic predations of capital in the global north. And so we need these new kinds of frameworks. So you're right to mention the global Cold War as really important. And I think that's one of the things that a whole, you know, over the last decade or so, maybe longer, um, there are increasingly new considerations of what the Cold War meant throughout the global South, right? That it's not just a kind of ideological struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union, um, but that in fact, it plays out in all of these movements, particularly for questions around economic sovereignty throughout the global South. And so that's absolutely a really key aspect of what's going on there and a key aspect of what the United States is standing in opposition to sending in you know, covert forces to overthrow in the whole post-war period. Great, thank you so much. And next we're going to move to Quinn Slobodian. Quinn is a um, professor of intellectual history at Wellesley and also the author of Globalists, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism, uh, one of the best books about the history of this neoliberal intellectual movement. And so Quinn, this struggle for the economic independence in the global South is directly connected to the fall of the left in the global North. Why were Western neoliberal thinkers so concerned about these movements for economic independence like the NIEO or earlier efforts preceding them like resource nationalizations in the 1950s in places like Iran and Guatemala? Yeah, thanks to everyone for organizing this and for um, attending and speaking on the panel. I worked for the UAW when I was at NYU when we were trying to get the um, Thing off the ground there and found it to be an extremely important experience. Not only did it create a sense of the world beyond the seminar room, but it also gave a chance to kind of map out the institution as it was, right? To, to physically go to each of the buildings that NYU owned and speak to people in different departments, give you a sense of the kind of octopus quality of the university, and then also just the different conditions and, and um, realities that people have faced. And if people are interested, I really recommend listening to them. Um, Gabe's most recent interview with Dan Denver on the dig because he does a lot of interesting stuff there, pulling out his stories of organizing into insights into academic knowledge production. So I think we could have actually just done the whole panel about that. But I'm happy to, to sort of talk a little bit about the history. And if you don't mind, I would actually center the university in my answer because it connects a little bit to the, the first book I wrote, which was really about um, students from the global south traveling to the global north to be educated and to be educated basically as foot soldiers of a very particular model of industrial modernization. But in many cases arriving in university campuses and using the space of the university to amplify issues that had nothing to do with simply raising the GDP of their home country. 
So people showed up and started complaining about the civil rights abuses, the human rights abuses of the often authoritarian governments that they came from. They showed up and started complaining about the human rights abuses and authoritarian overstep of the United States um, umbrella government that was protecting the Western European uh, security space at the time. And they generally misused and abused from the mind in the minds of the university administrators, the space of the university classroom and the university campus. And I think that's connected to the question you're asking, because if, I think that if one way of defining neoliberalism, which isn't the way I do with my book, but you could is to subject, you know, all of human and social life to the logic of commodification. And the special thing about the university in the 1960s is that relatively speaking, it was a space that managed to escape a lot of the pressures of commodification. In many cases, it was either free or almost free. People were given a chance to think and learn about things that didn't only have to do with um, the job they might have afterwards. They were able to do so without the incredible pressure of how to repay the cost of education. Um, and so in that space, they were able to do things that were alluded to in a lot of the Columbia um, strike literature, the, the, the occupation of the buildings in solidarity with the residents of Harlem, the anger against the way that Columbia's own research was being directed towards um, supporting the war effort in Vietnam. The university could be indeed a kind of a critical counterweight to all of the momentum and the motors of capitalism that we now sometimes call neoliberalism, but I think we could maybe just easily call capitalism at this point. Um, so the space that we're speaking from now is really the end point of a long reversal of that decommodification, right? I mean, it's extraordinary to me to read the nature of the demands that you all are making and see this as being described as something radical. I mean, it's extremely moderate, actually, what you're asking for. 10% reduction in tuition, 10% increase in financial aid. And then we have a panel at the end about the future beyond capitalism. I mean, that is, that's a, a, a minor tweak to capitalism, if anything, right? And so I think it's a testament to the, the, effect, the effectiveness of neoliberalism that it has narrowed the possibilities of our imagination such that we could be asking for 10% less tuition and, and then manage to call that a future beyond capitalism, right? It's, there's a huge gap between those two demands and they have everything to do with the history of the last 40 years, which we can, can of course all only sort of allude at and gestures and, um, and insufficient kind of brush strokes here. But I think, that, um, I think that would be my answer to your question, which is that the threat of education and, and and the global movement of peoples from the 60s to the present has often been the threat of the imagination of a world that existed beyond the logics of capitalism. And that has happened through the university as often as it has happened through um, the movement of um, authors or workers or you know, political activists. So I think it's important to, to tie this history that we're describing back to the kind of work that you all are doing. Because I, th I don't think it's just adjacent to it. I think it's directly part of it. So I just wanted to make that pitch. Yeah, it is one of the most interesting things about the idea of imagination. I think Barnaby is going to touch on this later, um, is that, you know, right around 1970, there's that you know, famous graph from Sam Moyne that uh, charts the use of the term socialism versus the use of the term human rights in the way that people conceive of a future. And right around 1970s, you just see the idea of even communicating about socialism just completely drop off. And so that is one of the things that um, I'm glad we're here to talk about today is like how to kind of shift this imagination back into creating um, a world in which we can imagine these different possibilities. But I, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question. In Globalists, you talk about how in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of these neoliberal thinkers, when they were introducing ideas such as the elimination of tariffs and just the complete freedom of capital to move beyond borders, a lot of these ideas were seen as radical, as extreme. Um, but by the 1980s, 1990s, a lot of these uh, treaties that were being negotiated between countries in the global north and the global south had incorporated a lot of these ideas as mainstream. 
And so can you explain just a little bit more logistically about how the intellectual efforts of the neoliberal thinkers were able to be translated into tangible policy changes during this period? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, the history of trade is, I think, endlessly interesting, partially because it doesn't lend itself to very easy simplification, right? I mean, there's great work on, for example, the fact that socialists were huge advocates of free trade in the late 19th century. Um, so I think that it's important maybe as a starting point to acknowledge that trade itself isn't sort of an evil that needs to be worked against. And then the only good movements are the ones that are opposed to trade. I mean, if thinking about Christie's work and the, and the development, uh, the dependent theorists, dependency theorists, right? They're often not about cutting off countries from trade, but it was about producing fair trade. And the, the insight from, from Adam Gattachi's book on world making after empire is essential, which is that often the kind of third worldist movements that were interpreted as kind of pushing away the modern world or something and sealing themselves off were actually new projects of transforming international relations. So I think that that's something I'd say as a starting point. And I think that it, it helps to enter any discussion of, of trade policy with the recognition that we have to get away from a binary trade bad, you know, well, protectionism good. It's just simply not, doesn't, it doesn't work that easily. Protectionism often produces new uh, collusion between corporate leaders and politicians that just lead to intense um, concentrations of wealth and corruption. So it's not always and often isn't at all a good thing. But the, the stuff that I write about in the, in the book is kind of the way that especially things like international investment law sort of become introduced and then normalized. International investment law gives sort of third party spaces within which corporations can sue countries basically that they've invested in for lost profits, sometimes even due to regulatory changes. So uh, uh, aid receiving country changes the policy internally that might raise taxes, produce more redistribution, and the corporation can then sue that country and the country the government itself needs to then recompensate the corporation for lost profits. So there's those extreme forms of managing trade that I think can be, um, you know, pinpointed on certain neoliberal um, actors and their interest, the interest groups behind them. And interestingly enough, these are exactly the kind of things that are being called ever more into question. Um, there's a lot of incredible work on what's called the third world approach to international law or TWAIL, T-W-A-I-L. And they um, are showing that actually more and more countries are rejecting international investment agreements bilateral investment treaties being written into uh, as conditions of aid. In fact, one of the things about the, the, um, the new NAFTA agreement is that it actually, the USMCA is it actually scales back to almost eliminates these kind of third party um, arbitration courts for um, what's called investor state dispute resolution. So I, I'm, I'm, what you, it sounds like I'm kind of muddying the waters or something in the response to your question, but I kind of think we have to. I mean, I think that first of all, it's not like I would sort of disagree with the argument that somehow the left fell neoliberalism, you know, dominated. And so now what do we do? I don't think it's that simple, actually. I think there's all kinds of strong forms of, of you know, left policy that are still out there. And I don't think that the reign of, of neoliberalism is sort of seamless and without its kind of contestation at all right now. And it's not just the masses sort of protesting their own immiseration. Within the kind of ruling class, there's a real question about what correct strategy is for governing world political economy. And so I think the best way to start thinking about that stuff is to realize that a lot of it is up for grabs right now. And the kind of the governing ideology is not, is not set in stone. For sure, yeah, and thank you for that um, contribution. Um, next, we're going to move to Annie Olaloku Tariba. Annie is a great writer and organizer. Um, and we're going to return to this um, idea of language and ideas um, that shifted during this period. And if I could ask Annie, um, in both the Global North and the Global South, there were radical liberation movements that arose during the 20th century. What kind of language of race were birthed by the revolutionary epoch during the 20th century? And what different languages of race were birthed by the following neoliberal epoch? 
Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm really honoured um, and also congratulations to all at OIDSA for the concessions that you've won so far. Um, I have like a very loose connection to Colombia in mm. that uh, Barnaby brought me um, <laughs> in 2018 when I was pregnant and I stuck into a few classes. So that's like the extent of my connection to Columbia. But I have been looking on, um, that was around the time that the graduate students were also fighting for unionization. So I got a window, uh, look into that. Um, in terms of your question, apologies, by the way, I'm on my phone because my laptop isn't connected to internet. So do tell me if you can't hear me because it is quite far away from me. Um, so my research mostly focuses on the history of blackness, which seems a pretty straightforward thing if you look at it from the vantage point of today, where like we have tendencies to think about blackness as this thing that stretches into the past. So either it's transhistorical or it's birth in the um, emergence of the transatlantic slave trade. And it's understood as a relatively stable community from that point onwards. And so what I try to do in my research is trouble this long history of blackness and try to sort of pick apart the ways in which different material conditions produce different articulations of blackness, which are laden with different kinds of meanings. And what do I mean by that? I mean, well, to be black in the 1960s or 1970s means something qualitatively different to what to being black means today. Um, and I don't think we've really properly reckoned with that. So what I wanted to do actually and was pick up on something that Quinn mentioned when he was speaking um, about a definition of neoliberalism, which talks about the commodification of all aspects of social life. Um, and I think in many senses, the travels of blackness from um, that uh, sort of post-war epoch uh, and the moment of radicalization in the 1960s and 70s um, into what we understand blackness as today kind of speaks to that um, and it, blackness in that period is subjected to a very similar process. Um, so in the 1960s and 70s, uh, okay, I'll start by talking about how I entered into this. So I entered into this kind of thinking um, through a very quite parochial debates in the UK about something called political blackness, which seems completely alien to most Americans today. And there was the notion of different groups of people, essentially from the global South broadly, um, people of Afro-Caribbean descent and people of South Asian descent joining together and fighting under the banner of a black identity. And it was presented at the time as this very particular local phenomenon, a British phenomenon. And in my research, I found actually there are loads of examples across the period in the 1960s and 70s of not just the sort of formal articulation of political blackness, um, which then manifests itself, um, not just in the writings of people like uh, Walter Rodney, um, in the work of uh, black uh, British scholars, but also going um, later into the latter part of the 20th century in the black consciousness movement, in terms of Biko's work, um, on uh, political blackness, of understanding blackness as a political posture. And that came from an understanding of blackness as a relationship to the means of production. And that means that uh, to be black at the time, to be blackened was a, a, a dynamic or a situation or relation of exploitation, um, which was produced by something called imperialism. So at the time, very few people talked about racism and a lot of people talked about anti-imperialism. A lot of people were talking about the sort of, um, dying European empires and the emerging American empires. And that was a key preoccupation in the thinking and literature of the period. And so what we saw is as the boundaries of what could be construed as liberatory politics or the horizon of liberatory politics move further and further away, um, that language of racism begins to creep in. And um, this is also sort of fed by state attempts to um, contain um, the political Im imaginary of anti-imperialist movements, and they become quite focused within the local, uh, within the national context and bound into the national state. So to speak of anti-imperialism is to recognize that the struggles of former subjects of empire in the UK are inherently or inextricably tied to the struggles of people across the global South who are fighting against not just formal colonization, but then the emergence, uh, the emergence and the articulations of neo-colonialism after the moment of independence. Um, but also uh, in, uh, sorry, I forgot my train of thought, but uh, as that kind of narrowed in, you begin to hear the language of racism, which is bound to 
status and I think Barnaby might speak to this sort of process of um, how we begin to understand ourselves within the confines of the state um, attempts to redress the consequences of imperialism which is the process of organizing people by racial groupings etc um, with a preservation of the categories which are produced by that racialism right so um, the field sisters field sisters talk in their book uh, in racecraft about how it seems so peculiar that the language of pseudo race science seems to be preserved most aggressively and acutely by the people who are victims of it, uh, black people. Um, <clears throat> and so in terms of the way that the language shift, what we got was uh, a political posture which articulated the possibility and necessity of abolishing race in its entirety, um, a shift from that to understanding redressing race as uh, the sort of uh, redressing of interpersonal harm, which is caused by racist attitudes. And as a consequence of that, today what we're left with is a world in which we cannot think beyond or we struggle to think beyond processes of racialization and they become naturalized to us. And the reason I tied that to what Quinn had mentioned about commodification is uh, if you think about how Marx describes the commodity, it's not simply that the commodity is a part and parcel with exchange, but that the commodity hides a whole series of social relations which happen underneath it, right? So it appears us to us as one thing, um, but actually underneath it, there are loads of things bound up in it. And that's kind of the position we're in today when we talk about blackness, we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement. We don't really have um, a mainstream poll which articulates a vision or a possibility beyond the existence of blackness. Um, and part of that is because we've come to understand blackness as ethnic or blackness as morphological. Um, and we're bound into the naturalization of what are the social processes which create blackness itself. Um, I don't know if that properly answers your question, but um, what I was sort of pushing at there is the collapsing of horizons, the shifting of the possibility of revolution. Like we have to think in the seventies, people were talking about being on the eve of revolution. Um, the Panthers were talking about survival pending revolution, but understanding was in this immediate moment, we have to survive, but revolution is possible and revolution is gonna happen and it's only a matter, for a matter of time. When you get the neoliberal backlash, when you get the crushing of those political movements, violently so, what that produced was a sense of despair, a sense of despondency, a sense of um, impossibility when it came to the question of revolution. And that fundamentally reconfigured the way that we understand crucial questions. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no possibility of bringing back quote unquote that language, but I think that what we have to do is think a bit more creatively. Um, who would have thought after uh, 2019, the Jeremy Corbyn um, gets project gets crushed in the Labour Party, we see like following up, we see the like crushing of the Bernie Sanders movement, where we were beginning to see a re-articulation of politics among the sort of technocratic language of neoliberalism. Those movements were being crushed. And then 2020, we get mass mobilization around precisely the question. Oh, sorry. We get mass mobilization around precisely the question that everybody wanted to avoid, which was race, right? Um, so that, that speaks to the fact that the way that this process of racialization, the way that this language of race has shifted is not itself, um, it's, not, it's not fully neat. There are chinks in its armor, but I think that it also means that we have to reckon with the fact, fact that if race itself is transformed by the process of neoliberalization as it was earlier transformed by um, the emergence of capitalism, then we have to think differently about what possibilities could be available to us today. Um, so it's not wholly a project of restoring. I think the project of restoring takes us so far. It takes us as far as understanding that we have more agency than we think we do, but actually it means thinking differently about what imminent possibilities are created by the context which we're faced with today. Um, and that means not simply replicating the slogans of the past, but transforming them to be fit for purpose today. I hope that answered your question. Definitely answered my question. Yeah, that was fantastic. And thank you so much for joining us today. And it's really valuable um important contribution so thank you um and finally uh we could move to uh barnaby rain barnaby rain is a phd candidate uh for history at columbia university who is thinking specifically about this question of why it became so hard to imagine the end of capitalism 
before I moved to Barnaby, I'd like to give a personal thank you to Barnaby. Barnaby has been influential, not just in my thinking on the subject, but very helpful on um, helping organize the tuition strike at Columbia, giving hours of advice to organizers. And that's really, really appreciated by all of us. And I'm really glad that you could join us today. Um, but for Barnaby, my question for you is that you know, when we talked um, about the Red Scare with Gabe or with the coups um, or with Christie, with Quinn, like the different ways in which um, economic independence movements were subverted, a lot of these conversations are about efforts from capital in the global north to subvert efforts in the left. And this is kind of a, uh, a way that is thought of often on the left. But what role did the left play in their own, um, I guess, failures during this period? It's a great question. Uh, uh... The miserable and a tough question. Thank you, Willem. First, can I say, um, and I will try to answer it, that um, thank you so much for having me on the panel. Um, it's a very great honor to be speaking with lots of people whose work I read and admire, but um, it, it's of course the greatest honor that um, I've been able to teach some students who have turned out to do such amazing work, including you. So, you know, the, the, most of your role as a PhD student and teaching assistant at a place like Columbia is just the reproduction of, of the ruling class, the reproduction of class society. But those moments where um, where there are little chinks in that armor, as Anna just put it, um, are um, are the, the proudest moments. So, um, um, so this feels wonderful to be here. Um, uh, to, to several of you, my, my, my former students who've been involved in this, uh, this strike, which has been an amazing uh, strike. Um, and I wish you every victory. Um, so I, uh, as you say, my, my PhD is a uh, sort of particular partial history. Uh, it traces one line in the conceptual history of this concept of transition, a very lively concept in 20th century so and political thought, um, the, the idea of the transition beyond capitalist social relations um, to something superior, something like socialism. Uh, and transition is not the same as utopia, right? It's a, it's a concrete strategic concept, a kind of roadmap for the supersession of capital. And while I think Quinn's absolutely right to warn us against a kind of fatalism that thinks that everything's been lost since the 1970s, um, uh, I think that there has been a decline in, in the ability to think that concept, certainly in the global north. Um, I don't. I don't pretend that this is a fully global story, but um, but the ability to think the concept of transition rather than just the concept of opposition um, to, to capital. And I think that we're led astray. So this is to get to your question, right? I think we're led astray by an impulse that's well founded, but politically potentially a dead end. And that's a kind of crude materialism that says, of course we lost on the left. This is a common kind of impulse. I think, of course we lost because the other side was so much stronger than us. That's why we lost all of these battles we've been hearing about, the new international economic order, um, uh, anti-racist and anti-imperialist struggles in the US, like Annie was just talking about the Black Panthers. You know, of course we were defeated because the other side's much more powerful. Now, that is a well-founded view. Um, I mean, to give just one example from my own uh, research and thinking, um, uh, given that it's very important to me that the early 20th century moment, the kind of Comintern moment, constructed a two-pronged global coalition in which capital would be taken apart by revolutions in the metropole, which would decapitate it, and revolutions in the periphery, which would cut off its access to colonial super profits. That global coalition in two prongs is very important. If you see things that way, then obviously McCarthyism and COINTELPRO become not just American problems, but world historic tragedies tragedies because they produced a situation in which you got a language of global revolution replaced by a much more difficult language of delinking in which militants in the global south were no longer able to to look to um, the, the, what, what they thought of as the center of world capitalism as a site of, of, of revolutionary possibility in the way that, say, you know, someone like Maria Tegi in the early 20th century could write that uh, Latin American revolutionaries uh, were, were carrying out their duties of solidarity with the masses of Europe, he said, in, 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 um, in enacting, trying to enact revolution there. There was a sense of a global unity in, in working class militants in the global north and anti-colonial struggles in the global south. Um, so, of course, the American breaking of the back of the American labor movement and the American left um, and American revolutionary militants um, was a world historic tragedy then that cut off the possibility uh, for lots of people of, 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 a, of a transnational solidarity. 
So it's well founded to think of these defeats as in, in, in sort of imposed by our enemies, but it's also potentially misleading for suggesting that we only have to revive and restate past hopes and just battle harder this time so that this time we'll finally break through enemy lines and do better. And I think the key question that's obscured here is how our defeats remade the world and so remade the terrain on which we must now struggle. So this is also to rule out a kind of crude idealism that says we lost because we took some wrong turns theoretically. Um, tracing how the end of capitalism faded as a horizon of political possibility should mean both recovering a sense of what thinking we've lost, what beautiful thinking we've lost, but also mapping the material processes that first transformed and then ultimately undermined left thinking. And so my answer, which is only a very partial answer, I trace this kind of very particular story for my PhD research. I'm just beginning, unlike others on this call, you know, I, I don't have illustrious tomes, I'm, I'm just starting, but my answer concentrates on the question of the state. Um, and goes back and, and says, we have to go back to these first decades of the 20th century and the gradual ascent of something called the state, um, whether that's a real apparatus or a kind of effect, um, but something called the state as a locus of socialist politics, the instrument with which to end capitalism. And the transformation, I think, of, uh, of left languages of emancipation into languages of regulation and planning, a kind of very particular socialist governmentality in which uh, the end of capitalism means something called politics, normally the state, but it can be instead, you know, workers' councils or Soviets or whatever it is, but something called politics regulating something called the economy. Um, and I think that that's a particular language for thinking about the end of capitalism that was brought, that, was, that arose in the early decades of the 20th century. It's quite different from the way that Marx um, and, and, and early in the turn of the 20th century Marxists certainly thought about uh, emancipatory social transformation. Um, and I think that then created a set of problems in the later 20th century. There's a, there's a, there's a classic kind of problem of sovereignty for anti-colonial and post-colonial politics, which is, oh, we've won our independence, but our state, the instrument with which we want to do things, actually isn't very powerful vis-a-vis -vis world capitalism. And I think that problem that's first posed by lots of anti-colonial thinkers, um, you know, it's posed from sort of people like Kwame Nkrumah thinking about neocolonialism, uh, posed long ago. So it gets posed in the 1950s and then really comes home to the West in the 1970s. You know, I work on lots of stuff happening in Britain where Tony Benn, sort of leader of the British New Left in the 1980s, says Britain the last colony left in the British Empire, you know, this feeling that, that, that Western European states don't have real sovereignty in the world system either. Um, and so, um, so, you know, my particular answer is to trace how a turn to the state um, then set up a set of problems for thinking about social transformation. Now, I think that should be a, a, not simply a kind of miserable story, but a potentially inspiring one. First, because it suggests that ideas about ending capitalism founded for subtler reasons than the whole quest being an impossible one from the very start, right? So that was the kind of 1990s urge. This was a, this was a kind of silly utopian move from the start. Um, still alive today, a recent book by Francesco Baldizzoni uh, about ideas of ending capitalism, and the subtitle is Intellectual Misadventures Since Marx, right? The whole idea was kind of a silly one. Um, uh, but, but secondly, I think that, that this, uh, that, that focusing on particular 20th century transformations of, of left thinking um, can, can, can be productive and not just depressing, um, because it clarifies what questions remain for us to, to reawaken. Questions basically, I think, of freedom, of the left taking back a language of emancipation which neoliberals were able to claim um, because, partly because social democratic welfareism had made its language regulation and, and statism. And neoliberals were able to claim a language of freedom, I think, highly deceptively. Um, and also it's to raise questions of internationalism, um, uh, because I think about this as kind of like a space time of the state. You know, the, 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 thinking about the state as your locus of politics involves a particular way of thinking about time. The state's going to come and plan the future. We're going to get rid of capitalist anarchy and chaos and have planning in its place. Um, and it also involves a particular relationship to space, first imperial and then national, right? The nation form is the space of, of state action. Um, and there's lots of recent work, I think, at the moment, lots of loads of exciting stuff going on of people trying to reopen these questions of left languages of freedom and left languages of, of global social transformation beyond the borders of nations. And both of those things, I think, try to kind of unpick, unpack this black box that was set up by, um, um, by, by, by the turn to the state. So I have lots more um, things to say, obviously, but, um, but that's my...
contribution to trying to trying to think beyond just we lost because our enemies were stronger than us, while knowing that that's of course crucially true, um, but also beyond the kind of idealist turn that says, well, we lost just because we had some silly ideas. I mean, I think there are all sorts of very sensible reasons why in the 1920s and 30s, using the state to plan your economy seemed like a pretty sensible uh, thing for the left to do, but it's just that the changing material conditions amid the end of empire um, made that horizon uh, less workable in places like Britain and France. Um, and perhaps one of the kind of post-colonial tragedies is that it was like so many other horizons carried over from places like Britain and France into the political thinking of, of anti-colonial politics in the global south, even though it was never quite workable there because its precondition actually was always imperial states that were very strong vis-a-vis -vis global capital. Yeah, thank you so much, Barnaby. And I, I want to say that um, I could easily have a conversation with each of the panelists about these subjects for an hour and a half. And I'm sorry that everyone is short on their time, but I hope that in our first hour of conversation, we've been able to show the links between these different movements on an international level, on a domestic American level. Um, and we have some follow-up questions from the audience some follow-up questions that I have prepared. But before we do that, would any of the panelists like to respond uh, to any of the remarks made by the other panelists? Uh, I'll leave a minute for that. Uh, and if not, we can move on to the audience questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> if we don't have any direct responses, um, one of the audience questions, I, I think directly relates um, to something that uh, Christy mentioned earlier. I think it was uh, Munoz Leto, who was a Mexican public servant who worked on drafting the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of the State, uh, which is part of the theoretical underpinnings for the NIEO, um, who described the charter as a collective expression analogous to class organization. And he said specifically that the developing countries are the workers, the industrialized countries are the capital. And so for the panelists, do you agree with this analysis? And if so, what role does the left in countries like the United States and the United Kingdom have to play in creating an international future beyond capitalism during the 21st century? I, I would just respond by saying, I, I don't think I have a, um, a direct response to Porfirio Munoz Ledo, who is, you know, um, still very active in Mexican politics. He's uh, very much part of the current left moment in Mexican politics, and he's still on Twitter. You can go follow him, you know, sort of building the Morena party in Mexico now. So uh, he's a he's a he's a really interesting character. I think a thing to realize about that particular moment, and I guess this is what historians do, right? But a thing to realize about that particular moment is to situate it in its context, and it's the context of the Mexican post-revolutionary state of the late 20th century, which has built this very strong corporatist compromise, right? The entirety of kind of Mexican post-war developmentalism is built very much on, um, you know, a strategy that the Mexicans refer to and that, you know, as a kind of out word at this moment, but at the time was referred to as kind of tripartism, right? In Mexico, tripartismo. And so the idea there is that precisely to get to some of what Barnaby was talking about, um, the state is sort of, it understands its role as being a mediator between labor and capital and that the three parts of that state, labor and capital together come to this kind of compromise that allows for authentic Mexican development at the time. Um, an important aspect of what's going on in Mexico at the time and that Porfirio Munoz Ledo is well aware of when he says this thing um, is that this kind of idea of scaling up the corporatist model that Mexico has built in its developmental state um, ignores the ways in which that state is simultaneously massively repressing channels of dissent that go outside of that corporatist model, right? And so at the same time that Munoz Ledo is arguing like, hey, we figured this out in Mexico and we just need to scale it up to the world. He's ignoring the fact that there have been massive, Mexi massive massacres of student movements, precisely the kinds of things that Quinn, have, Quinn talked about that you know, you're engaging in here of insurgent, um, you know, peasant insurgencies in the countryside, that there is a kind of clandestine dirty war going on to ensure that all dissent is kind of channeled through that corporatist compromise. And so that um, as a kind of cautionary tale, I think is an important thing to add into the context of that moment. Um, well then. Yes. 
May, uh, could I possibly ask you to just repeat the quote again? Because I had something to say, which is slightly tangential, but I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Uh, the quote is, the developing countries are the workers, the industrialized countries are the capital. Um, yeah, so the, the instinctive reaction, I know it's not particularly related to the points that Christy made earlier, but I've been having quite a few conversations in recent weeks with people and just understanding just how the extent to which this retreat into the nation's borders has um, blinkered people's thinking and understanding where it becomes possible to have conversations about Black Lives Matter or the possibility of racial emancipation or racial justice um, without thinking about people further down the line who are exploited in order to even create the conditions in which we might try to make our kind of justice in our context, right? So um, I think about the Black Lives Matter moment over the summer in which we had, um, in which we had uh, all these companies coming out to give statements of solidarity and being celebrated for them insofar as they were timely and also committed to hiring more black workers in the West. Um, but completely silent on their participation and exploitation in the global south. And I think about how one of the stories and um, in the way that I'm, I'm actually in an even earlier process than Barnaby of like putting together my PhD proposal, um, uh, how an integral part of the story is the story of migration, not just like the migration of peoples, but also the migration of work and different forms of work and how, um, the neoliberal epoch brings ushers in a, a transformation in the geographical location of different forms of labor, which then um, prevent us from or further mask from us um, processes of exploitation further down the supply chain. Um, and how that then means that oftentimes, whilst it's not necessarily the case that there's no revolutionary potential within the metropole, um, but oftentimes it's so easy within the metropole to think of our liberatory politics um, as one which is universal when actually uh, the silent part of it is in the West. So the silent part of, you know, black women, when black women are liberated, we're all liberated is when black women in the West are liberated, we're all liberated, which isn't true. And it's only a part of the story. Can I just jump in on that, Willem? Yeah, Quinn, go ahead. On what Christy and Annie said. Um, I think for me, the kind of discomfort with taking that kind of a quote as like a way to set our coordinates now is that it's really important to see that the kind of critique of the NIEO was largely valid, which is that, which is that this kind of language was often being used by a privileged class of elites in the global south as a way of amassing their own personal wealth and conflating the country with themselves, right? So I think there's a, there's a problem with this kind of, there's two problems with this kind of framing North South um, in which the South is simply the, you know, the tribune of, of the world's suffering peoples is that, you know, one needs to look very closely at who's making those claims. And the, the good thing about exactly that critique that Sam Wing writes about in the, in the 70s and 80s of this kind of language is that it questioned that. I mean, the global justice movement for all of its shortcomings was also quite attentive to the way that the lines did not run between nations, but in the same way that Annie is saying, they ran within nations and there are oppressed classes within each nation. So it's not a question of freeing the global South because who is getting freed when you do that? Um, the other discomfort I'd have to sort of descriptively is that I think it perversely kind of recenters the United States in a way that is actually totally not descriptive of global capitalism in 2021. Um, China is the story of global capitalism in 2021. Is China, where does it fit in this, in this schema, right? That it doesn't fit smoothly into our stories about the 1970s and 80s, for example. It requires, I think, a, a new framing and a new lens. And the fact that I mentioned this on Twitter the other day, you know, NYU Shanghai opened in 2012, and now Fudan University from Shanghai is opening a, a, a branch campus in Budapest in a couple of years, right? I mean, the axis of global capitalism is shifting as we speak. And I don't think it makes a lot of sense to sort of just revive these familiar geographies of the 60s and 70s because they're familiar to us. We actually need to sort of contend with the changing nature of the balance of economic power.
Could I really quickly reformulate maybe the point that I made, which is to say that in the same way that the unhelpful abstraction of talking about the global South as workers um, shields the sort of personal enrichment of a privileged class, it's the same way that um, talking about race um, or racial justice shields that actually the people articulating are often among the most privileged of that group, right? And so that process of abstraction, I think, has um, functioned precisely to um, smooth over or paper over some of the cracks which have emerged as we've seen an increasing de-racialization of the global ruling class in the sort of post-colonial moment. Yeah, I will just add to all of those uh, and really perceptive comments that um, a further point against reviving the, the formulation that the countries of the global south are the workers of the world and the countries of the global north the capitalists uh, is the transformation in uh, global class formation that has occurred over the decades since then. Right? The industrialization, which I was talking about before, is not only a phenomenon that happened in Detroit and Pittsburgh and New York or in Manchester, right? It's, all, it's a phenomenon that's happened to some degree around the world, uh, as Aaron Benenab's new book, I think, shows really well, foreshortening processes of industrialization happening in the global south and leading to parallel processes of increasingly precarious forms of class formation and class recomposition around the world, such that the thing that I was describing earlier uh, of the development of uh, what I kind of think of as a new working class, you know, in the context of a New York, right, where uh, low wage service sector feminized uh, and racialized forms of employment predominate. And here I think, uh, you know, sorry about healthcare in America among, among uh, big cities in America or ca urbanized counties in America, the one with the largest healthcare workforce is the Bronx. But that process of the development of that precarious service work, uh, service or sort of tertiary sector workforce is global. Its destinations are not all the same, right? The, the situation of a nursing assistant in the Bronx is not the same as a service worker uh, in the global South, or, you know, nor are global Southern countries the same as each other, obviously. Um, but there is a parallel process that has burst open uh, the idea of the national container uh, as itself a stand-in for a social class. Uh, and I think has made possible or potentiates forms of solidarity across national lines um, exactly because the kind of tripartite compromises that Christy was talking about before no longer have a social or economic basis. Uh, and I think, you know, we can even kind of optimistically maybe say we see some forms of beginnings of that even in the global north in uh, I think rising forms of anti-imperialist consciousness that it probably is fair to say we can see in social movements of the last few years. Should I come in on, on this question, William, as well? Um, yeah. uh, okay, so to the comments, I guess, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, Firstly, uh, it strikes me again how much, um, uh, how many of the debates of the 1960s and 70s are really a recovery of 1910s and 20s um, communist, global communist movement debates. Um, that's true in, in questions of gender, for example, much more than is appreciated. Um, but it's certainly true in the language of underdevelopment um, and proletarian nations, um, which is their clash, the, the, the clashes, uh, uh, the common turn and famously in Lenin's debate with M.N. Roy, for example. And so the idea of um, dependency and world systems theories as potential armor for the class projects of local bourgeoisies positioning themselves as subaltern, and he makes a very important parallel between that and the contemporary abstraction black wealth in which, you know, like Beyonce represents every black proletarian or something, um, the, 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 the dangers of these abstractions is interestingly sort of hashed out um, and argued out in the 1920s um, uh, where, where as, as communists are trying to work out how to relate to um, anti-imperialist projects. And then again, I think in the 1960s and 70s, but you know, Lenin's imperialism, the 1916 text has four countries, Britain, France, Germany, the USA as kind of equal centers, really Britain most of all really implicitly for Lenin there, but, but four roughly equal centers of finance capital um, uh, who's uh, dealing with, dealing with the surplus by, by investing it abroad. And that's obviously not what global value chains look like now. 
But it's also, to be honest, not really what they looked like in the 1960s and 1970s when lots of these models were being rediscovered and, and rearticulated. Um, you know, that's the age of the rise of Singapore, South Korea, Japan, before the contemporary firmament of Chinese investment in Africa, say, as, as which would seem to follow that very classic uh, model of imperialism. You know, I saw Quinn's tweet the other day about China and I thought of um, uh, the, the irony that just a few years after Portugal lost its last colony in China, Portugal is now the subject of China's Belt and Road Initiative. So like clearly there's been a complication in, 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 how, uh, in, in the political relations and the global value chains. Um, uh, but I think the interesting thing is it's not like it worked in the 1960s and 70s and it just doesn't work now. I think actually the 60s and 70s were a recovery of a 1920s world that actually worked then but still already didn't quite work um, in the 60s and 70s. But the last thing I wanted, I wanted to say um, is um, uh, where I think sort of slightly in defense of this language of proletarian nations and, um, and, and capitalist nations and whatever, I think that it can reveal something really important to us, uh, which is, which Willem will know because it's important when I, when I teach, um, which is thinking about neoliberalism, not as something that came to destroy post-war civilization, which is the kind of framing we have certainly in Western Europe through a kind of methodological nationalism that says there's a place called Britain or a place called France and we had our post-war welfareist moment and then it was destroyed by this neoliberal assault. Rather, I think that opening up the question of empire and seeing anti-imperialist struggles as things which were attacked by neoliberals shows uh, uh, illustrates a broader point, which is how neoliberalism came not to destroy post-war civilization, but to save it. You know, I teach Quinn Sabodian's book along with Adam Getachew's really brilliant book, but, but also along with Melinda Cooper's uh, uh, book um, uh, uh, about gender, where in all of these cases, whether it's thinking the question of colony or the question of uh, uh, gender and feminism, it, it, it reveals that these projects reveal how the neoliberal assault came to attack. If they were a counter revolution, they were a counter revolution against a revolutionary upsurge um, that sought to destroy the post war order. They were not simply a counter revolution against the post war order itself. Um, and I think then some of the interesting questions is how what the left was to do in that situation and how the defense of the post war order became seemed unfeasible. Um, and so there was really a, a, an attempt to break through and beyond it in a radical direction to destroy its orders of gender and nation and class um, or to or to transform it in another direction, which was the neoliberal project and maintaining the order as the kind of middle of the road social democrats wanted to do was was the project that that, that seemed most unfeasible. Um, but I think that's one of the things that we have to that we have to grapple with here. So so seeing neoliberalism as a counter revolution not just against the post-war world but against a much more radical project to transcend the post-war world which was the thing that neoliberals came to uh, came to destroy does anyone else want to respond to any of those comments before we go to our last question before wrapping things up okay and um in the chat someone earlier um, was asking the panelists if they have uh links to their book or their work if they could post in the chat um that would be great. If they uh, don't have time for this, you can find all of these people on Twitter and Google. They're all fantastic. Highly recommend following them. Um, but to wrap things up, I, this is a question um, from Simon Tora Sinta, who was on actually one of our panels yesterday. Um, and I think this kind of ties back into the work of globalists and conversations earlier with Quinn is like, as members of higher education or intellectuals at Western universities, um, what role do we as students or intellectuals or academics play in this uh, effort to kind of shift the politics in the world back to the left? Obviously part of this role is what Barnaby does is radicalizing your students, which is a important part of this fight, but especially in terms of like writing versus organizing, if anyone wants to come in on this. I mean, I, I would just start by, I, I'm sure Quinn has much more interesting things to say here, but uh, you know, I think um, many of us were involved particularly in labor struggles while we were, um, you know, graduate students um, and that those were very formative. And I would just say that one of the sort of lessons that I took um, I was on the organizing committee at GSOC UAW at NYU the second time we won our graduate union. Um, Quinn was there in a kind of earlier iteration during the, during the first struggle. Um, and so, 
um, one of the really key things that that moment when I was in graduate school overlapped with um, the Occupy Wall Street moment. And so there were much broader kind of mobilizations going on in New York and obviously around the country. And one of the things that was really important and formative for us um, at that moment was recognizing that, yes, we were, the, um, you know, graduate workers at NYU working for a contract and that we had won, you know, um, very important concessions um, and um, better working conditions just through the struggle for the union, even before we won the union. But when um, that, that struggle came to be linked to other struggles in New York during the Occupy Wall Street moment was incredibly important for us. Um, and one of the things that we did sort of in addition to organizing internally, you know, organizing the union itself um, was to build a coalition um, of similar student movements across universities. And so one of the really important things that we did during that moment while we were organizing was for instance, make a very strong connection for why our role as graduate workers at a place like NYU um, needed to involve supporting, for instance, workers at institutions at CUNY, um, at the City University of New York. And there is obviously a long history of, of struggle that goes on there. Um, and there were labor struggles, student struggles. There is an ongoing, you know, CUNY was free until very recently. Um, and so building that coalition, recognizing our own place within our place within the university within the global network university, as Quinn said, you know, the sort of um, massive blob that NYU became, um, but also recognizing sort of on the ground as workers within New York City, um, you know, the local that we're part of is an amalgamated local. And so it involves, you know, workers across um, many different shops. And so that was important, but then also making connections to other struggles at other universities was an incredibly important part of what we tried to do when we were um, doing that organizing when I was in graduate school. So that's just an example um, that, you know, I took a great deal from, and I think was one of the things that helped make um, our struggles and, and uh, make our struggles successful, but also make kind of our lives better um, while we were doing that organizing. Yeah, and before we move on to Gabe and Quinn, just to touch on this, I think that um, a lot of the students for the tuition strike at Columbia or also the rent strikes in the United Kingdom that are going on right now have spoken about this and how you initially get involved in something because you're like, well, I would like cheaper tuition because that affects me personally. And you have these experiences as organizing and you organize collectively in these groups as students and you understand the power of organizing politically beyond electoral politics. And I think that this can be really radicalizing for lots of students at Columbia who have seen the power we have as students when we stand together. And so I, I definitely think personally that has been meaningful for me. Um, but I see that Gabe has his hand up as well. Yeah, I would echo a lot of what uh, you just said, Will, and especially what Christy said. I too uh, had a very formative experience in, in graduate union organizing at Yale in my case. And what was powerful about that and what has really left its imprint on me is how the graduate students were in the same union as the custodial uh, and service and maintenance workers and the clerical and technical workers. So between the three, there were 7,000 people on campus who those unions represented or sought to represent, um, you know, who sh we shared an office, we shared staff, we shared, we shared campaigns. We were deeply integrated in many ways. Uh, many, many challenges resulted from that, right? It was not at all straightforward to, uh, in particular, persuade graduate students to uh, often follow the leadership of the elected officers of the recognized unions, which, uh, the blue collar union and the pink, so-called pink collar union, and to kind of fall in with a plan that emanated from that source. Uh, and you know, the converse was true also, right? To persuade our comrades who uh, in those unions that we were worthwhile allies and that this, we actually had enough in common that this struggle would benefit all of us. Um, and in many ways, I think that the, that solidarity, I can't say that it was a resounding success in such a way that it simply needs to be uh, imitated and diffused. Rather, uh, it was possible, right? We didn't fully achieve it, but it was very clearly possible. Um, and I think that to generalize this point, um, the processes of uh, economic dislocation begotten by neoliberalism that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half, right, have played out in the lives of college and university students, even ones at places like Columbia or like Yale, where I was a graduate student, that make it possible for us to uh, potentially orient ourselves in solidarity, not just with other student movements as we need to do, but with 
a broader working class movement and even an international struggle potentially. However, it's also not automatic, right? That that solidarity actually attaches um, on either end. And I think a lot of the work that we have to do as organizers is to figure out how to make good on that possibility, uh, how to identify the real points that we have in common with other movements that we want to and need to be attached to um, and how to work through the real forms of difference that potentially separate us which often take racialized forms, gendered forms, for, uh, you know, class forms in a certain way, although class is kind of complicated to talk about there. Yeah, I think that you have a lot to say about the PMC discourse that we could talk about at different points, but I know that it is 1.30. Um, I would like to leave room if any of the other panelists would like to come in on this question, but you're all also welcome to leave. Um, if I can just very briefly, oh, go ahead, Annie, I'll follow you. No, you go, you go first, Quinn, I'm happy to go after you. Okay. I'll be very quick. I mean, I just wanted to make an observation, I think, about the strangeness of this moment politically. Um, with the, the victory of, of Biden, we're in this situation where many, at least superficially, regressive causes are going to be placed onto the mainstream agenda by the most powerful country in the world. And that represents, of course, both an opportunity and a threat, right? It means that um, we can advance things like climate politics, we can advance some things like the move towards racial justice, the securing of reproductive rights for women, all kinds of things that are extremely important. But it, 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 express, it represents also a threat because there's a way that those demands are going to be watered down, defanged, co-opted, reproduced in class blind ways in the way that Annie was describing some of the movements towards recognition of racial injustice. And third, most importantly, it's going to leave the space for an opposition to that movement that has a sound of a righteous fury to it in the, in the forms of the right wing street movements that we've seen so much of in the last couple of weeks and months. So I think it's essential now almost more than ever because part of a sort of center left cause has a reassumed power in the United States for there to be an opposition movement that has as its horizon an opposition to capitalism and a desire for a world that is decommodified because the supposed resistance represented by the right wing right now just wants a more radical form of capitalism. And there, I think that leaves a space for people who are anti-capitalist to, to move in there, but it's going to be difficult because they're going to be portrayed as pawns of the ruling class and now pawns of the people of the World Economic Forum who also now speak the language of Black Lives Matter and climate justice and so on. So it's a new dance, I think, to sort of avoid co-optation or the, the, just the tarring accusation of co-optation while still building, you know, robust qualified mobilizations at the grassroots. If I could just um, come in on that question. Um, I guess I'm a bit different to most people on the panel. I haven't done any graduate study, so I finished my BA in what, 2016? And I've been an independent researcher since. And so like I'm coming at this question, not necessarily, I think there are elements of access to resource, et cetera, that you have by virtue of being in an institution. Um, I mean, I'm not claiming to have like any kind of educational disadvantage. I went to Oxford, so like, <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but I'm coming at it from a perspective of like, what is the role of intellectuals um, in this political moment? Mm -hmm. And I think where neoliberalism in terms of common sense, popular common sense has scaled back so much of what people conceive of as possible to change in the world, the role of people who have access to restoring, um, to reviving, to rekindling histories is um, in restoring that agency to people. So I do my work, I do my writing, I have a very complicated relationship with academic writing. But what I enjoy most is speaking to like actual people. And I think we're in a moment where, you know, reading and all of that kind of stuff is conceptualized as like classist and elitist and like, but in the 60s and 70s, you know, it was peasants reading Marx, right? Like <laughs> this stuff was completely accessible to people because people took the time to do that. People took the time to do translational work. People took the time to make critical ideas accessible to people and to help people to come to understand the world in critical ways. So I think that's the role of intellectuals in this moment is to try to rekindle some of those traditions which teach people to think beyond what is immediately present to them. And that means, you know, 
writing books and doing the research and getting the grounding, but it also means taking that knowledge outside of the institution and bringing people outside of the institution into the institution um, as a means of sort of showing that the kind of challenge isn't simply the power and resource that institutions have, but the epistemic framework that they're operating with, which tells us lies about the world, right? Lies that com common people who are sort of looked down upon by these institutions can dis dispel. Um, and so I think that kind of understanding that this work is not one directional, it's not our job to kind of have the gospel and go out to the world and teach it, but actually our sort of role to learn from the context at the moment and put that into dialogue with the history and with the past um, is really important. Brian, do you want to come in or? Sure, I guess, yeah. Um... Um, I guess I'll just say in a, in a panel of, in, of intellectual discussion to close a political event and yesterday you had such an amazing balance of um, high powered intellectual discussion and discussions of organizing um, your, 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 you at Columbia are reviving what praxis means. Um, but so I guess I just want to kind of finish by saying I think we have a bit too much of Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach on the left, you know a bit too much of that spirit and this isn't actually what Marx meant but of the spirit of give up and give up on interpreting the world the point is to change it because um, our problem isn't just that we're not fighting hard enough it's that we don't have all the answers we, we haven't actually done the work I think to understand exactly what needs to be changed and how um, which is why you know, which is why kind of anti-intellectualism on the left is, is a dangerous thing um, because our answers were honed in very different times the answers that we inherit um, uh, were, were honed from, you know, from a past that is a slightly foreign country. And so I think big questions about the present of the kind that Quinn was just raising are, are big questions opposed by the ability of the right to monopolize the language of ostensibly anti-systemic politics. Why is the attack on the status quo articulated as cultural? Under what conditions does the problem appear not as capital, but as George Soros, and therefore Black Lives Matter as an attack on something called a white working class, rather than a potential unity of the kind we might now celebrate and adore when it was forged by Fred Hampton in Chicago between the Black Panthers and the Young Patriots. Uh, you know, it's easy to romanticize that past, harder to ask under what material conditions of possibility this is actually some of the work Annie's doing, under what material conditions of possibility that took place, and what are the very different conditions of our moment that make it harder um, uh, for us to, to, to generalize a, a politics of, of anti-capitalism. So I think the process of working out answers for our moment comes both through reading and through participation in struggle. Um, and um, I've certainly learned a lot, both by spending time reading books and by spending time uh, on UAW picket lines and then fighting uh, against some people in the UAW. Um, and you also meet all the best people, uh, uh, not just through reading, but through struggling. Annie and I met organizing uh, campaigns for Palestine. So fight settler colonialism and you'll make the best friends. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to end it off today. And I, I do think and that's something that we have been trying to do with the tuition strike and we thank everyone here for being a part of is that organizing should be prepared with education to be as effective as possible. And I, I hope that everyone attending today um, was able to appreciate this fantastic panel. This has been an amazing moment for me as a part of the tuition strike organizing, um, speaking with all the people that I admire. Um, so this has been fantastic. Thank you to all the panelists today. Um, and then I'm going to make a couple announcements just for the tuition strike um, and post some links about the tuition strike um, and just um, update for ever, all of our viewers. Uh, there are thousands of students at Columbia on tuition strike. We have demands ranging from affordable education, boycott divest sanction for companies enabling apartheid in Palestine, fossil fuel divestment, which we have already won, and also relating to graduate workers and Columbia's investments in um, West Harlem. Uh, and so there are different ways you can support this campaign. Emily is going to post some of these links. Um, you can click with a click of one button, you can send letters to the administration supporting the tuition strike. Um, Columbia YDSA has been organizing this tuition strike. You can join DSA if you have not already or join YDSA if you are a student. You can also um, join the YDSA Winter Conference um, that we can post right here. We also have a strike fund um, to help cover late fees, um, thank you, Quinn, um, late fees for those um, who have taken on the tuition strike. And finally, we have some petitions um, and announcements um, from our coalition partners in Mobilize African Diaspora, which has organized around Columbia's expansion into West Harlem.
Um, so thank you again for everyone being here. It's just, just a fantastic panel. Uh, and I look forward to reading all the work of the panelists in the future as well. These are all fantastic thinkers. So thank you everyone. Have a good rest of your day.